trying to see if there anybody here who will know when I'm lying. Let's see. <laughs> uh, is that Walter Neumann? Oh, no. <laughs> Shh. Okay. All right. Well, okay. So, yeah. So, okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, so, <clears throat> so this talk is really somehow about manifolds, uh, which are, you know, objects, and then, uh, uh, you know, usually they're objects and they're morphisms, mappings. Uh, so this is all about objects. Manifolds are mostly about objects. And the, it's, it's sort of been an amazing fact that <coughs> studying closed manifolds or studying these manifolds has been a very interesting and fruitful thing to do. Um, and then studying the morphisms <coughs> turns out to be a lot harder. Um, I, I give it, I, 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 let, let me digress and give Smale's example of this. I mean, consider finite dimensional vector spaces as the objects. So they're pretty easy to understand. They have a dimension and so on. And then consider the, the morphisms. Well, they're linear maps. They're also pretty easy to understand as, as long as the vector spaces are different. It's just determined by the rank and the two dimensions up to isomorphisms, right? But if you have a linear map of a space to itself, it has eigenvalues. And so classifying them is like, falls into uncountably many different equivalence classes. You have Jordan canonical forms, a lot more complicated. So dynamical systems is like that. When you have a lot of self-mappings of an object, it can be very complicated. So progress is much slower in the morphism study, and although it's advanced quite a bit. But anyway, <coughs> back to objects, when you take nonlinear vector spaces, those are like manifolds. Okay, so it started, of course, First, everything was in uh, coordinate space in mathematics. People wrote formulas or Descartes and formulas and all that. And then Riemann did this great thing of there was this function, square root of z, or the logarithm, or some algebraic function that was not totally single value. And so he put the amb ambiguous values, like the two square roots of a complex number, made them abs thought of them abstractly moving around over the plane of z's and he constructed this new object which is now called a Riemann surface and that was an amazing step where you jumped out of writing formulas and coordinates and forming an abstract object so somehow that's when manifolds started in fact the manifold of chitin or something the german name for manifold probably was introduced by him so uh we're studying manifolds so <coughs> and uh, <coughs> he was working with one complex variable, so the manifolds that arose and basically, you know, you have uh, a lot of pieces of the complex plane in that case, and then mappings between various pieces. This is the abstract definition. This, this definition probably goes back to uh, uh, Herman Viles, one of the streets out there is named for him, 1913, the idea of a Riemann surface. Anyway, you imagine gluing pieces of C together by holomorphic maps, and then you get something, and then Riemann said what they look like, uh, sphere, the torus. Uh, this thing is strange. The sphere, the torus, higher genus surfaces, and they have non-compact versions too. Uh, and so, and, and this, this uh, well, the question I'm going to discuss today is, is uh, has a very special uh, picture here. <coughs> it's very rich and, and a powerful tool, and these things come up in every branch of mathematics, uh, arithmetic, analysis, probability theory. Schrodinger equation. I mean, anything you can think of, there's al almost always some kind of Riemann surface lurking there that's controlling some important piece of the structure. So it's, it's kind of remarkable things. And um, I'll mention later why, uh, 
why that's true, there's a great flexibility. Of course, in this century, uh, there's a new field called some of the 80s, the plectic topology, where these things are, are the probing tool, very important. Uh, right. Now, the, there's this other thing I like, and since this is kind of a, a, a lot of um, early career mathematicians, you might say. So this is a Riemann surface. I like to think a lot about what, what the words are, and, I mean, what the words really mean and so on. You know, this is a digression from what I want to talk about. It's not on my list here. Uh, there's this thing, <coughs> well, um, there's this thing called a Riemannian manifold, where you have a smooth manifold. You just have uh, something made out of a lot of charts and Rn and uh, gluing diffeomorphisms. That's a smooth manifold. And then you put on every tangent space a symmetric non-degenerate quadratic form. And uh, that's analogous to the two examples I'm going to discuss here sort of analogous. These are kind of quadratic things, too. And there's the notion of a Riemannian manifold. And uh, Riemann uh, uh, was proposing this as a model for space-time and mathematical generalization. So this is not a Riemann surface. I mean, Riemann surface is an example, a special kind of example. So another thing of Riemann. So there's this notion of a Riemannian Manifold, and so if it's of dimension two, it's a Riemannian surface. And there's this remarkable fact that uh, a Riemannian, again, this is only in this one dimension, a Riemannian metric, a Riemannian manifold. And if the d, if the dimension is two, the real dimension is two, <coughs> then. Uh, you know, so if you think of a banana or any any shape like this, then there's this amazing theorem due to Gauss actually that you can actually introduce coordinates so you can cover it so that so that these overlap mappings here are actually angle preserving, and so if you can actually any Riemannian manifold can be rectified in this way. And so if it's orientation preserving and conformal preserving angles, then it's actually given by functions of one complex variable. So every Riemannian two-manifold determines canonically a Riemann surface. So when I learned that, I was very happy. You know, and there's two, because people confuse the words, but they're different structures. OK, so, so this is it's very special that in dimension two that you can take a metric and do something with it locally. Already in dimension three, the set of metrics is more complicated than we know. We don't really understand what's going on. So this is a third topic, which is not really part of this talk. So I raise it quickly. Just the words couldn't resist talking about the words. about complex manifolds that for d equals 1, they're called Riemann surfaces, and they were constructed in a very natural way, and they're very useful tools. Then for d equals 2, there's a it's complex dimension 2. There's a powerful theory and understanding um, based a lot on work of Kodaira. And these objects in, in complex dimension 2 if, they ha if you have a little bit of extra information, like you know the second Betty number is non-zero, it's got some two-dimensional holes in it, then it basically, in that, and that's all you need to know, it can be deformed then to something defined by homogeneous polynomial equations. So it has a lot more structure. So in complex dimension two, well, it's analogous to what Riemann showed. Riemann showed all these Riemann surfaces are, can also be defined always by homogeneous algebraic uh, equations. They're always algebraic. So that something like that's true in dimension two. And there's a rich understanding of all these things. And it's very complicated. But this is like an ongoing thing. Uh, then in dimension three and more, if I just talk about I don't talk about the special kinds of things that make you, allow you to study this dimension. 
but you just talk about general compact complex manifolds. Basically, this, there's something very much unknown, and that's what the talk is about. And the, the basic question is, are they uh, abundant or rare? <laughs> sort of funny question. Are, are compact complex manifolds in higher dimensions abundant or rare? They appear to be fairly rare, but there's no theorem about, well, that's, that's what the, I'm going to try to explain. There's a sense in which we don't even have a, some kind of constraints or something like that. So I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, so OK, so let me, uh, let's see. So I have two things I want to do at once now, so let's see. Um, OK. OK, yeah, maybe here is where I want to go. So, so don't look at this or, or, or look at that yet. So, uh, so let's, let's be more precise about what a, a complex manifold is. So first of all, already the algebraic structure is kind of inter interesting and non-trivial. Of course, you have the notion of a complex vector space. So finite dimensional vector spaces over any field. You, th you pretend to think you understand them. They're uh, finite dimensional. I mean, if they're finite dimensional, they have a, they have a basis. And it's complete invariance, the dimension. Actually, if you hang out with people like Pierre Deligne, one of the pr professors here, you find out you don't actually know as much about linear algebra as you thought you did. <laughs> and I sort of, I make a joke about it. And all he knows is linear algebra, but he really knows it so well that he can prove all these deep theorems. So there's something, even in linear algebra, there's, you start, you know, as you start studying the automorphisms, you know, you see complicated Lie groups and stuff. Anyway, linear algebra. But it seems pretty simple if you do it this way. Uh, I mean, if you do it as a complex vector space. But you can also do it, this is a, a, somebody like me who has trouble with algebra, like to think of it rather this way. Uh, it's a real vector space with an additional endomorphism called J, where J squared is minus the identity. And then that forces it to be even dimensional. And then the action of this operator, together with the real scaling and so on, together makes it into a module for the complex the field of complex numbers. And so it's a complex vector space. So and then you can also try to express everything in terms of J. And that's a little more geometric and a little less algebraic. And then there's this notion of a, an almost complex manifold, which means it's a, manif a smooth manifold. So it's made out of these pieces of Euclidean space with overlap diffeomorphisms glued together, as in Hermann Weyl's definition of a Riemann surface. And on every, and then you can find tangents to the every, every point at the tangent space, and these are a continuous family of finite dimensional vector spaces, real vector spaces, making what's called the tangent bundle. And then, uh, if on every one of these tangent spaces you have a J endomorphism with squares minus the identity, that's called an almost complex manifold. And it turns out it's not so trivial to decide when a smooth manifold has a, an almost complex structure, although it's sort of, there's a robust set of machineries that will, I mean, a set of machines that will help you understand it. So for a lot of things, you can figure it out. Uh, like if you're in dimension six, well, <coughs> sorry, let's, let's go back to dimension two. Let's go back to these. If you're in dimension two, real dimension two, so D is two, and here D is four. Let's, say, let's use it. Little d is the complex dimension, and capital D is the real dimension. It, it, uh, such a vector space, oh, oh, the nice thing about a complex vector space, or one of these things with a J, it has a natural orientation. Because you can pair the vectors, uh, a vector and J of a vector, and then choose another vector in independent of that, W and J of W, and so on. And then you, and then if you, interchange those pairs, that, that's an even permutation. So there's a natural orientation. So if you have an almost complex manifold, it's orientable. Every tangent space has an orientation. 
and uh, that's sort of significant. So when you look down here in, in real dimension two, that's the precise condition. Every a manifold, manifold orientable, if only if it has a complex, almost complex structure. And you can put a J on every tangent space. And, and you know, the J is just, uh, in dimension two, it's just rotating like this, like multiplication by I, you might say. Actually, there are two ways, there are two orientations. This would be for one orientation, then the other orientation would give you what's called the conjugate complex structure. So conjugation exists and is important. Uh, got this watch for Christmas that tells me when my phone is ringing, so. <laughs> very, very interesting. So Tony Phillips is calling me right now. <laughs> anyway. Uh, where are we? So anyway, so orientability is exactly what it means to have an almost complex structure in dimension two, and it's a necessary condition. I'm going to skip these dimensions uh, where the little d is even. Those are actually easier to say lots of things about, uh, and that it's more elaborate and involves a slight digression into things called characteristic classes. I don't want, so I don't want to skip that. So let's stay in the odd dimensions. The next odd dimension then would be six. And then you want to know when, when does the six manifold have an almost complex structure? And it turns out, well, it's, it's, there's a certain uh, mod two, two dimensional cohomology class called the second Stiefel Whitney class. It measures, well, the first Stiefel Whitney class measures, there's, some, there's a sequence of things called Stiefel Whitney class. The first one measures whether the manifold is orientable or not. You sort of, you sort of go around a closed curve and you take a frame and you go around it and you see when it comes back, is it equivalent under orientations or not to the one you started with. And, and if you take that homomorphism into Z2, that defines the first Stephen Whitney class. And you triangulate the manifold and if it, the first Stephen Whitney class is zero, you can find a frame on the one skeleton and then you try to extend that frame over the two skeleton, over the two simplices, and there'll be a little obstruction there in pi one of the frames, which is for the orthogonal group of dimension bigger than two, is Z2. And so that assignment to every little two simplex of the obstruction to extending the frame over the two simplex defines a two dimensional mod two cohomology class. And if that is represented by an integral class, namely you can assign integers which reduce mod two to those obstructions then uh, that's all you have to do. Then, then the six manifold will have an almost complex structure. So the fancy words are the second Steve Windy class is the reduction of an integral class. So you can analyze it. So the obstruction is an element in the second, in the uh, third cohomology, was the two, it's a two torsion integral class in dimension three. So if your six manifold has no two torsion in its third cohomology, it has an almost complex structure. So, you know, almost any six manifold you'll meet on the street won't have two torsion in its third homology, so cohomology, so uh, which is the same as the two torsion in the second homology. So then you'll you'll have an almost complex structure. Okay. So there's a lot of almost complex manifolds in dimension six. And then we'll skip this dimension and then if you, dimension was D equals five and ten manifold. Haven't even thought about that. Uh, but you know, there's some machines you can hit against it and you can work out a lot of things. So there's a lot of almost complex manifolds in dimension six. Okay. Uh, right. Now, what that's, the word almost is here because that's not enough to be a complex manifold. To be a complex manifold means you can find charts where these maps are holomorphic. And what is it? And what does that mean to be holomorphic? It means that they're diffeomorphisms, and when you look at the derivative of the diffeomorphism, which is a real 2n by 2n matrix, it should commute with j. So there's a j, this is a, an open set in CD, so there's, think of it as R2d, there's a j there, and the diffeomorphism's derivative should commute with d, uh, j. Uh, then, you, when you do the gluing, the flat J 
Well, the J on Euclidean space and the J on this, and all these J's then fit together since it commutes. It carries one to the other. French transport of structure. The J of here gets transported to the J here because it commutes with J. So when you glue them together, you have a, a natural J there. But then there's this coordinate system where the J's are the J's of Euclidean space, which are just flat. They're parallel. So to be a complex manifold means that you can choose coordinates so that the almost complex structure, for an almost complex one to be a complex one, means you can choose coordinates so that the uh, J is flat in the coordinate system. You can translate it. It's not varying with the coefficients. It's flat. Constant. Forget the word flat. I meant to say locally constant in the coordinate. So that's what it means to be a complex manifold. OK. so. So even if we get the J, which is some work, then we have this other question about being an almost complex manifold, so of almost complex manifold being a complex manifold. Can you choose coordinates so it's locally constant? And so even though we know a lot about uh, the almost complex manifolds, or we can say lots of things about them, like I told you about dimension six here, uh, the second question is, uh, It's just, it's, um, I don't know what to say. That, that there's no known condition that, uh, I mean, the, if, if you, if there's a known obstruction for the original J to actually be, have these coordinates, but maybe you can change the J to another J, like deform it to get rid of that obstruction. So that's the real question when, that a topologist would ask, which manifolds admit are the underlying manifolds of a complex manifold. So they first have to have a J, but there are a lot of J's. Once you have one, you can homotop them around. It's a, it's a homotopy problem, which I'm going to discuss in a second more abstractly. And uh, there are a lot of, if, once you have one, you have a lot of J's. They form a space. You can figure out what the components of that space are. For example, here, the components here are the um, second cohomology group with integer coefficients. That's the space of components of the set of J's. And uh, who's calling me now? Well, my son is calling me now. <laughs> oh, All right. Uh, hmm. So, so you can figure, so you have a space of J's. If it's not empty, you can figure stuff out about it. But then knowing that there's a J, which for some coordinates is locally constant, this is the big question mark. So there's an abundant set of almost complex manifolds. And among those almost complex manifolds, the question is, is it rare or abundant that they actually admit locally constant coordinates to go with the J's? That's the question. Now, uh, you, do you like stories? Yeah. Yeah, some of you. OK, fine. So S.T. Yao is a famous mathematician. And uh, there's a famous, he, one of the things, he's done lots of things. The first thing he became super famous for was proving the Kalabi conjecture. And uh, so he did that 30 or 40 years ago, I don't know. And, uh, but first, he didn't think it was true. So he tried to make a counterexample. And he couldn't make a counterexample. And his efforts to construct the counterexample maybe suggested how to prove the conjecture. Because he couldn't make a counterexample. You know, you go here and you can't make it. And then you go here. And, oh, I go this way. Oh, there's something else in my way. And then he kept finding, uh, and then he figured out a proof. Well, this, he's also, uh, personality is uh, sort of forceful personality. Good, good, strong ego. Okay, that's all. And I've heard my my wife is a mathematician. We talk a lot about the fact that that uh, your the the predominant gender here uh, needs help with building up your ego and saying, you know, screw you, that's wrong, stuff like that. <laughs> you know. Okay, but anyway, Yao has no problem with that. And uh, <laughs> so, since he, when he couldn't make a counterexample he could prove the theorem, he started 
thinking, generalizing that. So there was this question, when does an almost complex manifold have another J so it's locally constant that I just raised? Well, let's consider that question. Well, amazingly enough, in this dimension, every J can be done. There are coordinates for every J. That's what I was just explaining with the Gauss business, sort of. You can take the J and add a volume, an area form, and get a metric, and then use the Gauss theorem to throw away the volume form, and you get the complex structure. So every J in this dimension is locally constant in some coordinate systems. It becomes a Riemann surface. And then he looked at it, and about 30 years ago, he looked at the dimension four, and he, f he was the first guy to come up with a J that, a manifold, which, uh, so in dimension four, he found some, j some manifolds using all this theory. See, if it was complex, you know a huge amount about it because of Kodaira's theory. And so he figured some stuff out and he found some four manifolds that had J's, but they did not have these coordinates. So in dimension four, the answer is, it's kind of rare. This is, when you have a complex structure because of this theory, you have a lot of extra information. Okay. So, uh, then he tried to make a counterexample in the next dimension, or in a higher dimension. So he tried to build a manifold that had a J, but no matter how you move the J around, you couldn't find one locally constant. And he couldn't do it. So just like in the Calabi conjecture. So he, is that, uh, I like to say he asked the question, but you could say he also, you know, this is always confusing. You say somebody's conjecture is this. They're usually just asking the question. Statement of the question and calls it somebody's conjecture. That happens a lot. But I think, I think, uh, I think he's written this maybe as a conjecture, but I like to just say it's a question. So Yao's question is, is it true that every almost complex manifold above this dimension is a complex manifold? Namely, you can deform the J to make it locally constant. Okay. Conjecture if it's true, we'll call it Yao's conjecture. Okay, that's the story. Well, we don't know. Uh, we don't know. Uh, so. Uh, being a topologist, I would like to prove that complex manifolds have some, or having been a topologist, I'd like to prove complex manifolds satisfy some topological condition, non-trivial topological condition, and then that almost complex manifolds don't satisfy. Those, so there's no such known condition at the moment. Um, now, uh, that's a little bit vague. Can we direct ourselves a little bit better in that question? So, uh, so the rest, so there's going to be some background culture, but uh, before I get to the full thing, so th there is this interesting other kind of structure, which is sort of analogous. It's uh, instead of having on a vector space, a real 2n vector space, this j, you can have on a real 2n dimensional vector space, we can have on a real vector space a non degenerate skew symmetric bilinear form. So that's just a tensor, two tensor skew symmetric. And if x times everybody is zero, then x has to be zero. And uh, that, as one knows, the rank of such a thing, if you write it as a matrix, is even. So the vector space is even dimensional. And, and that's, ca that's called a symplectic form. I think Herman Weil uh, made up that name, probably. Forgot what it means. What does it mean in Greek? Does anybody know? Know the story of the name? No one knows? Okay. What? I think it meant the same as complex. It was just sim instead of com and plex. I thought. Well, what do you mean it's the same? Well, it's com and sim are the same? Well, it's the. Um, See how men are, they're very aggressive. The Greek form of the Latin <laughs> what? The Greek form of the Latin roots. 
I mean, the Latin, oh, it's the same it's root. The, same root. the Greek. Root. Okay, okay, okay. So it's like the Greek version of complex in the yeah. sense of language. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Huh. So this is Greek and this is Latin. Okay. Cool. What? According to Anakanada De, Silva, De Silva's book, in the introduction, it says it is the name of the bone of a fish. The na- say it again. Say I don't it have trouble hearing. It's the name of the bone of a fish. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. This is in Herman Vall's book, The Classical Groups? No, no. Anakanada De Silva. Ah, okay. All right. By the way, it's good to look at that book by Herman Vall, The Classical Groups. The introduction. Uh, as far as I got, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> that was enough, I mean, you know. Uh, right, so there's this other completely different thing, but at least the root is somehow related to this root for some reason. And, uh, well, let's go back. Remember what we said, for a mapping to be in this context, the linear, the diffeomorphism, the linear mapping, the linear approximation has to commute with J. So we, you know, we could say, well, uh, let's talk about an almost symplectic manifold, which means on every tangent space, you have a non-degenerate skew symmetric form. So it has to be even dimensional. And we'll call that an almost complex manifold. And then we'll ask, are there coordinates where the symplectic form is constant? And then we'll call that a symplectic manifold. Just the same, exactly the same. Almost complex manifold, complex manifold, okay? They're locally constant. Uh, well, okay, so, what? Yes? This is back to the, the Gauss question you were talking about. Is the, is the question that uh, you should be able to deform any almost complex structure to like a nearby one that's actually complex, or could you have to like go to a different connection? Okay, translate the question. Well, she wants to know whether Gauss is talking about homotopy classes of J. So the question is that ah. every J could be homotop to something. No, nah, that's too vague. Okay. I mean, it, it, it's not that precise. Yeah, Just yeah. Some. But I mean, um, yeah, that would be a more precise version of the question. You could ask for which ho- components in the space of J's can you find a good guy, right? You, you know, there's, you have the space of all J's and the good guys, empty, maybe non-empty. We can ask all sorts of questions about it. You know, it's uh, not going to be ubiquitous though, because there's another theory. Theory. Um, yeah, I forgot to say that. Yeah, there is a theory about this. See, Riemann developed a theory of moduli. You know, the complex structure actually depends on parameters, and he made what's called the Riemann moduli space, and that's an object of ext- extreme interest in, in mathematics and all to- all sorts of points of view. The moduli space of Riemann surfaces, and then Kodaira, working with Spencer, extended Riemann's ideas to make a moduli space of complex structures in all the dimensions. And the formalism of that theory is quite amazing. It's uh, the little Lie algebras there, and they generalize, and there's all sorts of, I mean, you know, you could go on, you can go online now and look in the archive and stuff. There's all kinds of papers about the algebra that this sort of engendered, starting with Gerstenhaber and so on. But Anyway, the, the infinitesimal story is very interesting algebraically, and then because Kodar was an analyst, Spencer was an analyst, they actually did the analytic part too. They did the algebra part and the analytic part. And then it turns out for a compact manifold, the uh, moduli space is finite dimensional. And the space of J's, I could probably come up with plenty of manifolds where the space of J's is topologically infinite dimensional. So they wouldn't be ubiquitous. They wouldn't fill up all the topology. They might fill up all the components. But anyway, th- well, no, that's true. Uh, well, algebraic varieties have finitely many components, but I don't know whether these moduli spaces have finitely many components. No, they may not. I was about to say they only fill up finitely many components. We can almost prove it, but it's incorrect, the proof. Okay. Uh, anyway, that's a good question, but it's about, that's a further question. I just want to know whether it's non-empty. If one is non-empty, is the other one non-empty, as in, in the abstract I wrote. Okay, so where was I? Oh yeah, we're over here again. 
So we have the analogous notion of almost, almost, locally constant, locally constant. Okay, and then we have the names, complex manifold in Latin, Greek manifold here, okay. Then, you know, uh, well, amazingly enough, there's an analogy between these two discussions, sort of, a, or a dictionary between them. And I, I wrote this down here, one jet. So what's a one jet? A one jet is like the derivatives of something, first derivatives of something. So to be an almost complex manifold, the, the derivative, the linear map has to commute with J to be a sim almost symplectic manifold, the linear maps have to preserve this skew symmetric form, which you usually write as an omega, omega of x, y, or something. And I have an omega here, and omega here. And this would be the standard omega, and it has to commute with, with that. So it has to send the quadrat. Not, you, to commute means uh, it, it, when you transport this bilinear form over here, you get the one that you have here. So these define subgroups of the, all the linear transformations. So the ones, so you have, you have names for these things, all the real linear transformations in dimension 2n, 2d. This is, wait, sorry, d. Let's just call it 2n, even dimensional. So those are all the, for any diffeomorphism, there's a derivative in there at every point, and then the ones that preserve complex is GLNC, the complex linear. See, if they commute with J, then they commute with the module structure on the vector space of the complex numbers. So they become complex linear. And then, what's the symbol for this one, SP? SP. SP2N or SPN? 2N. Uh-huh, okay. So this one's called the ones that commute with the preserve omega is called the symplectic group and sp 2 n or that the Lie group and so on. Well, these are completely different dimensions. This one has dimension 4n squared, square of this number. This one's got n squared complex dimensions, so therefore 2n squared real dimensions, right? This one has dimension 2n squared. This, is this n times n plus 1? Had a little test. I think it's, what? I think that's the 2n times 2n plus 1? No, that's be too big. 2n, this is not either of these two numbers. It's, uh, <laughs> I would say uh, you can figure it out. I mean, I figure it out every now and then. It takes me a whole weekend, but I can do it. <laughs> uh, I'll say it's n times n plus 1. Wait a minute. Yeah, because n times 1 plus 1 over 2 is kind of a natural thing. Multiply it by 2. I don't know. I think this is close. Well, let's we could check some examples. Uh, this is three when n is one. No. <laughs> when n is one, it's three, right? It's area preserving, yeah. so it's three. So this number has to give three when n is one. So how can we get three out of that? Vector space. Oh. And then you want to find a cross section. This is a homotopy problem. Only depends on the algebraic topology of what's going on. So when you, uh, this is called reducing the structure group. We have a, this is the structure group when we start with our manifold. If we can reduce it to here, that's putting a J on. If we can reduce it to here, that's putting an omega on. It's, and these are the homotopy problem. Now there's a neat thing about Lie groups is uh, Non-compact Lie group has a maximal compact subgroup, and I don't know if you have to say any extra words. Walter can tell me. Let's say you don't say any extra words. Then um, let me just check. Uh, no, I don't think you have to say any extra words. Yeah, you don't have to say any extra words. Um, it has a maximal compact subgroup. You know, it has it has a compact subgroup, so take a maximal one, and uh, then the whole Lie group. It's just sort of the product of Euclidean space and the maximal compact subgroup. So it deformation retracts to its compact subgroup. I think that's true without any hypothesis. If it's not true, then we'll add the hypothesis. I don't think it's any hypothesis. So it turns out the maximal compact 
subgroup here, K sub G L N C, and the Maxwell compact subgroup here, S 2 N, are actually isomorphic compact Lie groups. I won't bother saying, give the other name for it. So that means that any manifold is the space of ways that you could put this omega on, or the space of ways you could put this j on, the space are a homotopy equivalent. They have the same number of components. They're non-empty if only if one's non-empty, the other's non-empty. Same components, same fundamental groups, same homotopy groups. Everything is the same. Just sort of strange. I mean, maybe that's why, well, that's one reason. So it's not so strange to have these words be very closely related. So whenever you have an almost com whenever you can put an almost complex structure on the manifold, you can almost you can also put an almost symplectic structure. And I put quotes here because this phrase isn't used very much. This is used all the time. This one's not used very much, but it should be. I mean, why is this one used and this one not used? I mean, okay, but we have the same question now. You know, when can we do this and so on? And then, uh, let me erase this. Oh, wait, no. So they, they have the, so almost complex is the same. Oh, I'm not getting anywhere. Almost symplectic. Oh, well, I get to, this, I get to the formulation of the question more precise. OK. So this is the same. In other words, if the space of such things here is non-empty precisely when it's non-empty here. And in fact, the spaces are homotopy equivalent for this given, given M, given a manifold M. OK. Now, now, see, I call this thing omega. What I call omega is kind of a notation you use for a differential form. Omega, eta, nu, and you have d, the exterior d, a differential form. Because it's on the tangent space, so you put in two tangent vectors and you get a, uh, a number and it's skew symmetric in terms of that. So it like measures the area of the parallelogram. It's a measurement of the area of the parallelogram spanned by the two. So it's a differential form. And then it's, it's a nice theorem that, uh, that this, this condition here is equivalent to d omega is zero. So if omega is closed if and only if you can find coordinates. I mean, if, if you can find coordinates where it's locally constant, then certainly it's not varying as you move from point to point. So it's closed. That's obvious. And the other way is called Darboux's theorem or lemma or something. And then there's a, a differential equation for this one too, but I don't want to write it down. But, but already, this gives an interesting consequence about this question. So we get, if you have an almost complex manifold, which is exactly the same as being an almost complex manifold, and you can also find such a structure where this thing is closed, then you can look at the, uh, the wedge product of omega n times. And um, this, this will, just by linear algebra at a point, this will be a, a volume form. I mean, it'll be a non-zero form of top degree in the exterior algebra on the tangent space. And now if it's a closed manifold, that integral will be non-zero. The integral of this over the manifold will be non-zero. Let's just say not equal to zero because it has a sign. And so it's non-zero, and this thing is non-zero in cohomology. Well, if, if this factor, if, so all of these, so this implies that all of these products are non-zero in cohomology. So you get that you take any old almost complex manifold, it's also an almost symplectic manifold, and if it were uh, also an almost symplectic manifold. If it's, also, if it's actually a symplectic manifold, then you get all of these non-trivial -tri cohomology classes. So the, the H2 is not equal to 0. The H4 is not equal to 0, dot, dot, dot. 
all the way up to the top. So I would love to have something like that. So this brings joy to a topologist's heart, you know, I mean, sort of, this is, this is a real non-trivial condition. Uh, so this is used a lot. You're playing around and you, with these things, and then you suddenly wonder if this is symplectic. You say, no, no, cohomologically, it's ruled out by, by this obvious fact. So it's a very useful thing. Simple things are very useful. You can use them easily. So, so, we, so there is no, so <coughs> now back to this analogy. So we, the first analogy was that the homotopy theory of the two almost versions are the same. And then, uh, then down here, I, I, I wrote it before, there, there, you've probably all heard of mirror symmetry. I've heard of it too, I don't know what it is, but <laughs> I can say it. But, uh, I, th I think some physicists looked at a quantum field theory and they looked at it in, in one way from, and they looked at it in another way. And then they had, if they sort of switched the theory around, the one way of one theory was the other way of the other theory and vice versa. So they had this thing called mirror symmetry. And so you could, you could have a sort of a, kind of a holomorphic discussion of the physics, or you could have a sort of symplectic Lagrangian discussion of the physics in the other model, uh, some kind of mirror symmetry. So that's, that's a much deeper, but I, th I think of this as a starting point, that this first thing is like the first indication that this thing might exist. This is very old. This now, so, uh, and, and this is a huge, a huge story, this dictionary. And, um, oh, uh, oh this. Uh, so, uh, I mean, w one of the first applications was some very interesting combinatorial identities were derivable from this mirror symmetry. So it's, it's really here to stay, and it's a deep thing, and uh, that kind of algebra that I mentioned that arose here was highly developed by Kinsevich, and uh, he has a homological formulation of this um, using that fancy algebra, they call Lie infinity algebras and things like that. Um, so this thing is, this thing is re there's really something deep going on here. And this is the first instance, and then there's deeper instances Okay, so since it, there is this deep thing going on, here we have this dictionary. We have almost, almost, fine, locally constant, locally constant, fine, extra homological condition, fine, nothing here. See, that's the question. What is the natural thing that goes here that in the mirror dictionary corresponds to this condition? What goes here? Now, I have this feeling that uh, there's something there and it's not too far out of reach, just we haven't thought of it yet. And uh, so, let's see. So, we have to look, ar look around for it. I mean, what, what's the nature of it? We have to sort of think, well, what are these things like abstractly and something? Well, uh, well, I kind of notice this lack of knowledge in a 76 paper I wrote and for Sarah's 50th birthday. So he's 80 something now, so that's a long time ago. 76, I think, yeah. And, and you can and I notice that you can discuss things about symplectic manifolds and complex manifolds and, and, and there's some analogies, but some missing pieces. So this, this when, I, when I noticed that. Uh, and then in the 80s, this, there are more conditions, I think, to be symplectic, coming from symplectic topology. But they're kind of, I don't know how to state any of them. But I think you can get more conditions in specific instances, certain symplectic manifolds satisfy. No? Nothing's general is known. No. no, no, not general, no. but you can do, you could prove some Manifolds are not symplectic. That, no, that no. Uh, oh, you don't have any that. Only in dimension four. There are oh, oh, okay, just four, like here. Ah, very good. <coughs> right, 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 right. Very, very good, very good. So, right, so it's very analogous to this then. Yeah, very analogous. So then the 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 analogy holds. So that. Cantrix 
So to see, but see, we're even pre that because we don't have the analog. So what Duzi just said is that uh, above dimension four, the, in fact, I, was, I asked somebody this, actually the question. Above dimension four, suppose you have a almost symplectic manifold in these dimensions and assume it satisfies these simple conditions. You've got a two-dimensional class whose power is up to the top. Is it always a symplectic manifold? So Deuce is saying there's no, this is Deuce's conjecture now. No, it's not my conjecture. No, no, well, let's just say it's your conjecture now, okay? Well, let it be your conjecture. People have no idea, right? Right. You have no idea. It's a question. <laughs> right. But I would like, yeah, I'm just saying, I would like to know, before we ask that question, I would like to know what do you put here first? There should be some preliminary condition that's non-trivial. And then, you know, then, then you would have analogous questions here and here. What? Excuse me? What's the symplectic analog of I'm worrying about the sixth sphere, whether the sixth sphere has an integrable complex structure? You know, I once asked go to Ma if he was still a communist. And he said, Professor Sullivan, do you still beat your wife? In other words, you ask a question presuming there's an answer. Is there a symplectic analog? Of okay, fine. <laughs> uh, I don't know one. I have a, other anal analogs of that question, however, but they're related to Ramani and geometry, which I'm not getting to. Uh, well, so I'm looking around for how to think about this. Okay, so uh, before 76, I was at MIT and Gilliman and uh, in Boston, and Gilliman and Sternberg were developing in more precise detail a wonderful theory of Ailey Carton, and I just wanted to mention that here. And uh, so let's go back to the definition of a manifold. So we have pieces of Euclidean space and some diffeomorphisms between various sub pieces that we're going to glue together. But we could just consider pieces of Euclidean space and partially define diffeomorphisms and let can form the pseudo group they generate, which means you can compose any two arrows wherever they're defined, stuff like that. So you get what's called a pseudo group. The pseudo there, because it's not globally defined, is like a category. You do it when you can. And then in, in, in these cases of a manifold, you, the, the space of orbits is nice. It's the manifold itself. And you can let this generate an equivalence relation. And it's, that's the space of orbits of the pseudo group. And, and the quotient is nice. You know, like it's Hausdorff, and you can form the quotient and get a nice manifold. And then, but if you just put a, a, a random thing here and you s form the pseudo group, the quotient, the space of orbits, might very usually isn't, wouldn't be Hausdorff. You did it randomly. And then you get, I mentioned you use dynamical ideas instead for this to study such a thing. So that's what dynamics is about. That's the thing about objects and morphisms. Anyway, uh, and, and this whole picture here is thinking about structures on manifolds that are defined by coordinate charts, whereas the Riemannian metric is not defined by coordinate charts. It's an almost structure. And if, if, it, if it were locally constant, that would mean it would, the, if and only if the torsion and the curvature, uh, uh, well, if and only if, if, and only if it's a, a, a locally Euclidean manifold. So that's not part of this, well, it's sort of part of this structure in a second, but. And then so there's this nice theorem. So we, so uh, complex manifolds are inside the pseudo group of holomorphic diffeomorphisms. And symplectic manifolds are inside the pseudo group of symplectic diffeomorphisms. You, you take this general picture of pseudo groups, take sub things where you have a Hausdorff quotient, and those are your manifolds in the category. And so now this thing of Gilliman and Sternberg was a, a list of general pseudogroups that are locally transitive. Did I write that somewhere? I didn't write it somewhere. Okay. They should be transitive. Well, <coughs> uh, and well, you could have finite dimensional ones like Lie groups. Uh, you can build, man you know, these maps could be parts of Lie groups. It could be real analytic. They extend to some global thing like the Euclidean space. You could have affine manifolds. You do this on the sphere, have Moebius manifolds, projective manifolds, any, any kind of Lie group. 
you can let act on an, on something and then take open sets there and glue those. And, and so finite dimensional pseudo groups, which are groups locally transitive or part of Lie group theory, let's put that aside. And then you can have things that are reducible pseudo groups. I'm talking about now what are the big pseudo groups that can be considered. So enclosing, enveloping pseudogroups that can be considered. And another one is you can have a foliation, local foliation, and the pseudogroup preserves it. Namely, it maps a leaf to a leaf. Then there's kind of two pseudogroups here. There's an induced one on the transversal, kind of a tangent one. And you can build the structure of these out of irreducible ones. And then, amazingly enough, there's a finite list of infinite dimensional irreducible pseudogroups. So either they're Lie groups, finite dimensional, or they're reducible, or they're on this list. And the list can be described by, well, you either work over the reals or you work over the complexes, and you either use the concept of volume or, no, working over the complexes means we, we put J in, inside the thing, for, at the bottom. And then it turns out the list, this is Elie Carton's list, he worked out the power series, the, the jets, all the higher jets, and worked out what are the possibilities are. They're all the diffeomorphisms that preserve volume. That's the pseudogroup. Oh, you first you have all diffeomorphisms, all. That's all smooth manifolds. Then you have all the ones that preserve volume. And then you have all the ones that are symplectic, preserve the symplectic form, um, the flat, locally constant symplectic form. And there's an odd dimensional analog called contact. Ailey Carton invented that too, or that name too. Let's, let's skip that now in the interest of time. And then in the complex case, you, all things are complex now. Your J is embedded in the definition. And then you have complex volume preserving and complex symplectic. And then you have to double this layer because you could also have maps that scale the volume by given constant, volume scaling, symplectic scaling, complex volume scaling, complex, complex symplectic means a skew symmetric form on a complex vector space. And there's another odd dimensional version here called the cauchy green CR structure, doesn't matter. And anyway, that's it, that's the list. These are all the infinite dimensional irreducible pseudogroups. Then you have Lie group theory. All right, so, hey, well, suddenly that's pretty cool because we got our two things came out, you know, and there's just a few more, and that's it. So what do we do with this? Well, suppose you have a manifold. Well, we've, we, we did something with this. We want to do something with this, remember? I can do something with this. And, and I can do more with this than one did with this. And I'll take uh, four extra minutes to do just this one, OK? And the idea of the whole talk, which I didn't even get to it really, was I'd, I'd like to use the combination of this, the extra thing here, and uh, to do something about this. But it involves some other ideas. But uh, not, they're a work in progress. Like, not worth talking about it. They might be nonsense. Anyway, so here is, so here's the, this is a well-known argument. I remember when I told this argument to Yao, he said, I thought of that 30 years ago. Anyway, so I trying to, this, this was related to the S6 problem, right? So, this is a little lemma. Uh, if S6 has a complex structure, then it does not have a complex volume. But what's a complex volume? So let's think of six variables. So we have three complex variables. You know, volume form is dx1 dot dot, dot dxn locally, right, times some function. That's a volume form, right? So now we'd have dz1 dz2, dz3, DZ and then we'd have some function phi of z1, z2, and z3. That's what it would look like locally in charts if we had a complex volume. That's what it means to be a complex volume. Um, then, so call this thing 
this. Well, <coughs> these dz means it's, it's a differential form which, which assigns to a tangent vector a complex number, a real number. The complex, so you've tensored the uh, real forms with the complex numbers. And when you tensor a vector space with a complex, a real vector space with a complex vector space, which is already a complex vector space secretly, then the thing you get is two copies of kind of the same vector space. You get a copy where the, uh, the j is going like this and another copy where the j is going like this. You get the complex vector space with its j turning one way and another copy of the same space with the j turning the other way. That's, and so you can extend that to the differential forms and so on and you can form omega and you can form omega bar, it's complex conjugate, where you just put bars over everything. So this is a well-defined object. And then you can do the wedge product of the, now this is a three-dimensional differential form. We're in a six-manifold though, so it's only half dimension. So you, you, can, you can put in three vectors here. So this is three-dimensional, and the bar is also three-dimensional. So this is now six-dimensional. And what does this look like? This looks like phi, phi bar, dz, dz bar, dot, 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 three times, right? dz1, dz bar, dz, da, 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 da. So this up to an i factor is the same as this thing with a six, right? So this is a volume form. And this coefficient here is the absolute value of phi squared, so it's positive. In fact, this argument proves more than a volume form. And so when you integrate this, it's non-zero. And this form is closed because, uh, let's go back to this thing. See, so in a complex manifold, <coughs> you can write exterior D as where you differentiate the holomorphic variables and you differentiate the anti-holomorphic variables. So uh, if you differentiate this, you would get another dz, but you have a maximal amount here. So you'd have a dz1, say, dz1 squared is 0. So if this operator doesn't do anything to this form, it gives 0. And this operator, it doesn't depend on z bar. This is holomorphic. So this operator is 0, too. So this form is closed. It's always closed. And then this is closed, this is closed, the product has a non-zero integral in the top dimension, and so you get that the third Betty number is non-zero. So you get H3 is not equal to zero. So it can't be the sixth sphere, okay? So you can get extra topology in a complex manifold in this uh, argument.